The next two amino acids that we're going to focus on will be the aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine and tyrosine. And we're going to look at how our liver cells can metabolize these two amino acids, ultimately forming acetoacetate and fumarate. Now, acetoacetate can be used by our hepatocytes to form ketone bodies, while fumarate can be used to form glucose. And that's exactly why these two amino acids, phenylalanine and tyrosine, are known as glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids because we can use them to ultimately form both glucose and ketone bodies. So let's begin by examining step one. And actually what step one shows us is we can transform phenylalanine directly into tyrosine. And this is precisely how our cells can synthesize tyrosine by beginning with phenylalanine. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes step one is phenylalanine hydroxylase. And this enzyme is part of a category of enzymes we call mixed function oxygenases. So this is a mixed function oxygenase. And what that means is it uses a diatomic oxygen. It takes one of the oxygen atoms within this diatomic molecule, places it on this reactant, the phenylalanine, and this basically forms the tyrosine, and this oxygen is shown here. Now, the other oxygen atom goes to form water, and that's exactly why water is released here. So, phenylalanine hydroxylase is a mixed function oxygenase. Now, in order for the phenylalanine hydroxylase to be able to catalyze this step, it has to use the reducing power of an electron carrier molecule we call tetrahydrobiopterin. Now, tetrahydrobiopterin is actually not a vitamin because our cells can synthesize this molecule. And to synthesize this molecule, we basically begin with dihydrobiopterin. So, in the presence of NADPH and an H plus ion, the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase basically takes the dihydrobiopterin and transfers the reducing power from NADPH onto this molecule to give us tetrahydrobiopterin. And then, and then this mixed function oxygenase, this enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase uses the reducing power of tetrahydrobiopterin to basically form tyrosine. And of course, we also use up the reducing power of this molecule to form quinonode dihydrobiopterin. Now to regenerate back the tetrahydrobiopterin so that it can be used again in this reaction, we use an enzyme called dihydropteridine reductase. And this enzyme takes the reducing power of NADPH, transfers it onto this molecule to form back the tetrahydrobiopterin so that again, we can use the reducing power of this molecule to undergo this first step. So again, in the first step, we utilize a phenylalanine, a diatomic water molecule. We use NADPH to basically give us this. And by using the reducing power of this molecule, we transform the phenylalanine into tyrosine. So one of the oxygen atoms goes onto this ring of the phenylalanine and the other one is used to form a water molecule. Now, once we form tyrosine, what happens next? Well, next, we basically have to use an amino transferase to transfer the alpha amino group from tyrosine onto an alpha keto acid. And so we have the enzyme tyrosine amino transferase. And just like any amino transferase, this one has to use PLP, so pyridoxal phosphate. We transfer this alpha amino group from the tyrosine onto an alpha ketoglutarate. Now the alpha ketoglutarate, upon receiving that amino group, we form glutamate. Upon removing the alpha amino group from tyrosine, we form this alpha keto acid, the p-hydroxyphenylpyruvate. Now, once we form this molecule, the next step is to use a dioxygenase. And unlike an oxygenase, where one of the oxygen atoms 
uh, was used to form water and the other oxygen atom went onto the phenylalanine to form the tyrosine, the, an enzyme that we call dioxygenase uses a diatomic water, uh, a diatomic oxygen, and it uses both atoms of that diatomic oxygen to attach it onto that substrate molecule. So in this step, we basically want to remove this carbon dioxide and we want to use both of the oxygen atoms and attach them onto this substrate to basically form an intermediate we call homogentisate. So the enzyme that catalyzes this step is p-hydroxyphenylpyruvate dioxygenase. And so ultimately, we attach an oxygen here onto this carbon, and the other oxygen goes onto this ring here. So now we have two oxygen atoms here, two oxygen atoms here, and this carbon dioxide group was basically removed as carbon dioxide. Now, in the next step, we want to use yet again a dioxygenase. So now we use homogentisate 1,2-dioxygenase. Again, we use a diatomic water, um, a diatomic oxygen. One of the oxygen is basically attached onto this carbon. The other oxygen is attached onto this carbon. So ultimately, we break this sigma bond and pi bond within this ring. We attach the oxygen here and here to form this intermediate 4-malleal acetoacetate. Now, in the next step, we basically want to isomerize. So we want to transform this uh, cis group into a trans group. So we have the cis double bond here, but we want to form a trans double bond as shown here. So the enzyme that catalyzes this step is an isomerase. So we have malleal acetoacetate isomerase, which uses the activity of glutathione to basically form this molecule, the 4-fumaryl acetoacetate. And the final step in this reaction in which we ultimately want to cleave this sigma bond here by using essentially a water molecule, this is, uh, this is catalyzed by fumaryl acetoacetase. And so ultimately we form a fumarate because once we cleave this bond, the oxygen essentially attaches onto this carbon and this becomes a CH3. And so we form acetoacetate and fumarate. And now this can be used to form a ketone body and this can be used to form our glucose. So we see that inside our cells, we can transform phenylalanine into tyrosine. And so ultimately, we can basically form tyrosine within this step. And both phenylalanine and tyrosine, by following these series of steps, can be transformed into these carbon skeletons, acetoacetate and fumarate, and these can ultimately be used to form fuel molecules, so either ketone bodies in this case, or glucose molecules in this case.